This guy is a real jerk. Well, sort of. Let me explain. You see, in 1869, a single careless mistake unleashed an invasive species that has plagued North America's forests for over a century. It all began with an ambitious Frenchman whose experiment went horribly wrong, and nature has been paying the price ever since. Every spring, a strange spectacle unfolds across North America. Trees once lush with budding leaves become draped in webs as millions of caterpillars dangle from branches. Unfortunately, this is not nature working as intended. It's the legacy of one man's actions. This is the story of Leopold Truvelo, a 19th century scientist with a fascination for silk production. In his quest for scientific progress, Truvelo unknowingly set the stage for one of history's most infamous ecological disasters. But the tale doesn't end there. Nature had its own response to this invasion, and it's one you won't want to miss. Stick around to discover how the story unfolds and the surprising way nature fought back. In the mid-1800s, a young Truvelo, born in Aisne, France, made his way to the United States, carrying with him dreams of scientific discovery and an adventurous spirit. Truvelo was not just any traveler, he was a man of many talents, an artist and an aspiring naturalist with a passion for entomology, or the study of insects. In France, he had honed his skills working with silkworms, learning about the potential of breeding insects to support silk industries. When he arrived in the US, he sought to expand his research and contribute to American science. In New York City, he quickly gained recognition for his artistic skills, particularly in the realm of astronomical illustration. This led to a career as a sketch artist for scientific publications. However, Truvelo's true passion lay in natural science, and it wasn't long before his attention turned toward insects, particularly silkworms. The U.S. was eager to establish its own silk industry, and Truvelo saw an opportunity to help advance this rapidly growing sector. With years of experience in silkworm farming, he believed he could make an impact on the American silk industry by breeding silkworms that were stronger, more resilient, and better suited to local conditions. However, his ambitions were about to take a dramatic turn, one that would change the course of ecological history. In 1869, while living in Medford, Massachusetts, Truvelo made a fateful decision to experiment with a new insect species, the European gypsy moth, now commonly known as the spongy moth. Often when dealing with an invasive species, it's nearly impossible to pinpoint exactly how they arrived in the non-native habitat. In many cases, we assume they were accidentally carried across the ocean by boat, hidden among cargo or stowed away in the ballast water of ships. But the spongy moth is different. Its introduction to North America can be traced directly to Truvelo and a single ill-fated experiment. Truvelo had no idea that what started as a harmless experiment would lead to the nightmare that still unfolds today. At first, the excitement of his discovery blinded him to the potential risks. But when the larvae began to escape, a creeping anxiety took root, one that would torment him for the rest of his life. Truvelo's plan was straightforward at first. Leveraging his experience with silkworms, he sought to overcome a critical obstacle in silk production, their struggle to adapt to the American climate. While living in Medford, he imported a batch of spongy moth larvae, hoping to crossbreed them with his silkworms to create a hardier, more adaptable strain better suited to the US climate. The spongy moth, native to Europe, seemed like an ideal candidate for this experiment. Unlike silkworms, which were highly specialized in their diet, spongy moth larvae fed on a wide variety of plants, including the hardwood trees abundant in Massachusetts, such as oak trees. This adaptability and their ability to thrive in the local environment made the spongy moth an attractive choice for Truvelo's research, though he could not foresee the disastrous consequences of his experiment. To keep his experiment under control, Truvelo initially confined the caterpillars to nets draped across his backyard. These makeshift enclosures were meant to ensure the larvae wouldn't crawl away while he monitored their behavior and experimented with breeding techniques. However, this approach proved far less secure than he had anticipated. Things went awry in ways that, in hindsight, seem almost inevitable given the fragility of his containment setup. Truvelo's nets, while well-intentioned, were far from secure, and he failed to take stronger precautions to ensure the larvae remained confined. 
The gaps in the enclosures and the caterpillar's persistence proved too much for his makeshift barriers, allowing some to escape into the surrounding environment. Realizing his mistake, Truvelo desperately tried to recapture the escaped caterpillars, coming through the nearby trees and setting traps. However, the small elusive larvae had already spread beyond his reach. What seemed like a minor oversight at the time soon became a nightmare as the spongy moths began to spread uncontrollably. It started as a small infestation in Medford, Massachusetts, a few trees here and there, nothing too alarming. But over time, it became clear that the spongy moths weren't just surviving, they were thriving, spreading faster than anyone could have imagined. Within two decades, forests across the northeast were being devoured, setting off an ecological chain reaction that would be felt for generations to come. The spongy moth larvae are notorious for their voracious appetite. They are capable of consuming massive quantities of foliage, particularly favoring hardwood species like oak, maple, and birch trees. These trees were essential components of the North American forest ecosystem, and the loss of their foliage would have far-reaching consequences. By the late 1800s, it became clear that Truvelo's experiment had unleashed an ecological disaster of unprecedented scale. As the larvae continued to feast on the foliage, they left entire forests stripped bare. The loss of tree cover meant that many species of birds, insects, and mammals that depended on those trees for shelter and food were suddenly faced with an uncertain future. Forests that had been thriving ecosystems were now decimated. Not only were local wildlife populations affected, but the entire ecological balance of these areas began to shift. Without the trees to regulate the environment, the region became more susceptible to extreme weather, pests, and disease. The changes were evident not just in nature, but in the economy as well. Forestry industries, which relied on healthy forests for timber, paper, and other products, saw their resources depleted. This economic strain spread across communities, leaving them to grapple with the consequences of the infestation. The pest's insatiable hunger made them difficult to control. They were not only defoliating trees at an alarming rate, but their unique feeding behavior and mobility allowed them to spread rapidly. As the larvae grew, they would disperse by a method known as ballooning. This technique allowed the young moths to be carried on the wind, traveling long distances to infest new areas. Their ability to travel and reproduce quickly, as well as the lack of natural predators, created the perfect conditions for them to thrive. A single female spongy moth can lay up to a thousand eggs in her lifetime, ensuring that even if some of the larvae were killed off, the new generations would be born to continue the destruction. The spongy moth's rapid reproduction rate combined with its aggressive feeding habits made it nearly impossible to contain. By the turn of the century, the infestation had reached the farthest corners of the northeast and had even begun spreading into the midwest. By the early 1900s, federal and local authorities had launched full-scale efforts to manage the infestation. However, the scale of the problem proved to be more than anyone could have anticipated. Early attempts at control included the use of chemical pesticides, the burning of infested trees, and the introduction of natural predators. While some of these efforts yielded modest results, they were not enough to halt the moth's spread. One of the main challenges in controlling the spongy moth population was that, unlike many native insects, the moths had no natural predators in the United States. In Europe, the moths were kept in check by a delicate balance of predators, parasites, and environmental conditions. These natural controls helped maintain the population at manageable levels. However, none of these factors were present in North America, which allowed the spongy moths to multiply rapidly and spread across vast areas without restraint. In response to this, scientists began to experiment with biological control methods, hoping to find a way to limit the moth's numbers without relying on harmful chemicals. One of the most notable methods involved the introduction of parasitic wasps. The wasps would lay their eggs inside the spongy moth larvae, and when the eggs hatch, the larvae would feed on the moths from the inside out. The idea was to release these wasps into affected areas to reduce the spongy moth population in a natural, ecologically friendly way. While the parasitic wasps did show some success, they were not a perfect solution. First, the wasps were not always able to find and target the moth larvae efficiently, especially in large, spread-out infestations. 
Additionally, their impact was slow to manifest as it took time for the wasp population to grow and begin having a significant effect. This meant that even with the parasitic wasps doing their best, the spongy moths continued to thrive and spread in many areas, leaving scientists to continue searching for additional control measures. The introduction of chemical pesticides also had its own set of problems. Arsenic-based sprays were used in an attempt to reduce the moth's populations, but the chemicals also harmed other species, including beneficial insects and plants. The environmental consequences of these efforts became a growing concern, as it was clear that the use of harmful chemicals would only create more problems in the long run. Despite these early attempts, the spongy moth population continued to grow, and the battle to contain them became a generational struggle. By the 1980s, after nearly a century of failed attempts to eradicate the spongy moth, scientists discovered a new weapon that could potentially help in the fight against the invasive species. The baculovirus Lymantria despair multicapsid nucleopolyheterovirus. That's a real mouthful, so we'll just refer to it as LDMNPV. This naturally occurring virus, long known as a regulator of spongy moth populations in their native habitats, was found to be particularly effective against the larvae of this invasive species. Unlike chemical pesticides, which often harm beneficial insects and disrupt ecosystems, LDMNPV infects and kills spongy moth larvae without posing a threat to other species. One of the most fascinating and gruesome effects of LDMNPV is a phenomenon the Germans call Wipfelkrankheit, or treetop disease. The virus manipulates the caterpillars it infects, altering their behavior in a way that maximizes its own spread. The virus carries a gene called EGT, which blocks the caterpillar's ability to molt and keeps it in a constant feeding state. This manipulation drives the infected larvae to climb to the tops of trees, hence the name treetop disease where the virus completes its deadly work. As the caterpillars die, their bodies liquefy and disintegrate, releasing a rain of virus particles onto the foliage below. Uninfected caterpillars feeding on the contaminated leaves then contract the virus, perpetuating the cycle in a chillingly efficient manner. This phenomenon not only showcases the virus's effectiveness as a biological control agent, but also underscores the intricate ways nature can turn the tables on an invasive species. The baculovirus LDMNPV is uniquely tailored to target spongy moths while remaining harmless to humans, bees, ants, and other non-target organisms. In addition to its use in pest control, baculovirus technology has found applications in biotechnology, where it has been used to produce therapeutic proteins and antibodies. However, for spongy moth management, LDMNPV represented a glimmer of hope amidst an otherwise bleak history of containment efforts. Despite its promise, LDMNPV was no silver bullet. Scientists spent years refining how to deploy the virus effectively, learning that timing and environmental conditions were critical for success. The virus needed to be applied when caterpillars were actively feeding, ensuring that enough of them would ingest the virus to trigger an outbreak within the population. Its effectiveness was also highly localized. While it could suppress the spongy moth's outbreaks in specific areas, it could not prevent the moth's steady spread across new territories. Today, LDMNPV is a cornerstone of integrated pest management strategies used to manage spongy moth populations. It works alongside other biological controls, such as parasitic wasps and the selective use of chemical insecticides. While the moths remain a persistent problem, the discovery of LDMNPV marked a turning point, demonstrating that solutions to ecological problems can often be found within the natural world itself. Leopold Trubelow's legacy is one of great complexity. He was an accomplished artist and a passionate scientist, contributing much to the fields of entomology and natural history. However, his introduction of the spongy moth to North America would overshadow much of his other work. His mistake stands as a notorious example of ecological mismanagement, highlighting the risks of introducing non-native species to new environments. Though Truvelo died in 1895, his actions continued to reverberate through the decades. Modern control methods have reduced spongy moth numbers in some areas, but they remain a persistent pest across much of the US. In hindsight, it's easy to judge Truvelo for his mistakes, but what do you think? 
he did take responsibility for his actions and tried to mitigate the damage as best he could with the resources and knowledge available at the time. Let me know down in the comments below.